Our reading tonight comes from the book of James, chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. James, chapter 1, verse 19. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. This is God's word. As uh, is our custom here, can I encourage you to keep your Bibles open um, as we go through this. Now, I am aware, if I'm right, that when John McIndoe was here, he preached on this passage. Is that right? Come on, you, you were here, I wasn't. Okay, so someone said yes. Okay, can you remember what he preached about? Can someone give me a synopsis? I'd hate to contradict him. I remember once, I shouldn't tell you this, uh, preaching a sermon at the First Church of Past in Australia that I'd done as a one-off and now I was doing through a series. And I said to someone, you know, I preached this about three years ago and I'm worried people remember. And they said to me, what did you preach on three weeks ago? And I said, I can't remember. Uh, so hopefully I won't contradict John, but hopefully we'll learn something now. Let's pray. Our Father, we uh, recognize that this is your word, and therefore it is fruitful for us. It not only informs us, but it changes us as the Holy Spirit works into our lives. So we pray that you would help us to hear carefully what you have to say to us this evening, and we ask that you would enable us not just to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And we ask that as we wrestle through this text, and that you would help us also to see the beauty of Jesus. For his sake we pray. Amen. The new minister was asked to teach a boy's class in the absence of a regular teacher. He decided to see what they knew, and so he asked who knocked down the walls of Jericho. All the boys denied having done it, and the preacher was appalled by their ignorance. At the next deacon's meeting, he told about his experience. Not one of them knows who knocked down the walls of Jericho, he lamented. The group was silent until finally one seasoned veteran of disputes spoke up. Preacher, this appears to be bothering you quite a lot. But I've known lots of those boys since they were born, and they're good boys. If they said they did, they didn't. If they said they didn't know, I believe them. Let's just take some money out of the repair and maintenance fund and fix the walls and let it go at that. Now that's the problem, I think, sometimes with the Word of God is that there is a certain level of ignorance. I keep getting reminded when I stand up here: don't assume. People know when you say you should know this. And the reason sometimes we don't know God's word as well as we ought to is precisely because we have lost the art of listening. There is a difference between hearing and listening. All of you are hearing what I'm saying right now. Whether or not you listen to what is being said that will evidence itself in what happens after the sermon. There is an element to listening that causes us to want to take what we hear and integrate it into our lives and work it out when it concerns the Word of God. I remember at university doing a, a course called Language and Communication. 
And they talked about in that course active and passive listening. Passive listening is when you are engaged in a conversation with someone and your mind is anywhere but that conversation. Now, we've all been in situations like that, haven't we? We've had things on our mind and we're thinking about what's happening next week and we're hearing the words t uh, coming at us, but we're not really taking those words in. Active listening means that the whole person is engaged in the listening process, that you are tentative, that you are not just hearing words, but that you are taking those words and they're becoming part of your process of listening. And this is what James is getting at in the next, in fact, eight verses that follow this. He has already said in the previous context, verse 18, and I think this is a continuation of that. Let me just read the verse just to remind you. How does he end? He says, For he chose to give us birth through the word of truth. Now, as if he wants to elaborate on that a little bit more, he wants to expand on that. And so the preceding context and then the successive context of verses 22 to 27, I think inform us that what James is now uh, driving or taking our attention to is how we view the Word of God. Do we listen to it or do we just hear it? And this listening then becomes very important. And so he, he gives us some instructions on the importance of how we are to listen to the Word of God, what it requires, how it affects our being. And so notice how he begins when in verse 90, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. In the original, that can either be in an imperative or an indicative. It's most likely that it's an imperative. In other words, this is James' way of saying, listen, time to sit up and take note. This is important. I want you to hear this and hear it carefully and imbibe it into your everyday life. And so it's important for us to learn how we are to listen to the Word of God so that it doesn't just go over our heads, so that we don't just leave here saying, well, that was a great sermon, and two days later from here, and someone says, so, so what was preached on Sunday night? Oh, I can't remember. What passage was preached on? Oh, somewhere in James. That it becomes part of our lives. Because the only time God's Word is truly integrated is when it's applied. And that means we've really listened. So what does James want to instruct us? Firstly, God's Word must be received with submission. God's Word must be received with submission. Verses 19 to 20. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen slow to speak, and slow to become angry, for man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. First, under the heading of God's word must be received with submission, we must be quick to listen. People need to hear correctly the word of God. It's not only important that we listen, but it's important that we listen correctly. Because what happens sometimes with God's Word is that verses can so be easily dragged out of context and made to mean something they don't mean. Like the lady one day who was opening her Bible, seeking to get direction from God. You know the story? And so she opened up her Bible, and she put her finger in the Word of God to see what God was saying to her. And it said, and Judas went out and hanged himself. So she thought, well, that can't be right. Surely God doesn't want me to hang myself. So she closed the Bible and opened it up again uh, to, to see what God's Word would say. And the next verse she put her finger on and said, go and do thou likewise. And so she thought, hang on, this can't be right. It, it, I, I must be misreading God's Word. So she closed it up and opened it up again and put her finger in the Bible and opened her eyes and looked at it. And it said, whatever you do, do quickly. Now, that is so easy to take God's Word out of context, to rip it out of its context and make it mean something it doesn't mean. And so we are 
told that we must hear carefully the message of God and therefore quick to listen. Proverbs chapter 17, I love this proverb, verse 28 says, Even a fool is thought wise if he keeps silent and discerning if he holds his tongue. And that's so true, isn't it? We need to be quick to listen. They need to hear God's word through careful listening and careful self-study so that we don't distort the word of God and we don't try and make it fit into our particular bent on what we want it to say. Treatment of God's word should not be rushed. We should meditate upon it. We should think on it. We should allow it to penetrate into the depths of our soul. Remember when Joshua is in battle and Moses, uh, uh, on behalf of the Israelites and Moses is standing and, and, and praying. What is he doing? He's meditating on God's word while they are in battle. In other words, there is a sense in which here is a, a man meditating on God's word while the rest of them are out there battling. It's important for us to allow God's word to sink down into the depths of our soul. Treatment of God's word must never be rushed, but we should be quick to hear before we are quick to speak, lest we speak out of turn. Now, let me try and illustrate this with a parable. A new candidate for church membership asked, was asked, what part of the Bible do you like best? He said, I like the New Testament best. They then asked, what book in the New Testament is your favorite book? He answered, the book of parables, sir. They then asked him to relate one of the parables to this committee that were considering him for membership. A bit uncertain, he began. Once upon a time, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the thieves, and the thorns grew up and choked that man. And he went on and he met the queen of Sheba, and she gave that man, sir, a thousand talents of silver and a hundred changes of raiment. And he got in his chariot and drove furiously, and as he was driving along under a big tree, his hair got caught in a limb and left him hanging there. And he hung there many days and many nights. The ravens brought him food to eat and water to drink. And one night, while he was hanging there asleep, his wife Delilah came along and cut his hair, and he fell on stony ground. And he began to rain. And it rained 40 days and 40 nights. And he hid himself in a cave. Later he went on and met a man who said, Come in and take supper with me. But he said, I can't come in, for I have married a wife. And the man went out into the highway and hedges and compelled him to come in. He then came to Jerusalem and saw Queen Jezebel sitting high and lifted up in the window on the wall. When she saw him, she laughed and he said, Throw her down out of there. And they threw her down. And he said, throw her down again. And they threw her down 70 times 7. And the fragments which they picked up filled 12 baskets full. Now whose wife will she be on the last day of judgment? There was no one on the membership committee who felt qualified to question the candidate further. And thus they agreed that this was indeed a knowledgeable candidate. How often do you and I distort the word of God because we haven't listened carefully enough to it? How often do you and I rush out to say certain things and take certain verses and use those verses to justify our behavior? How quick are you and I not to allow the word of God to penetrate into our soul? How are you and I so quick to go to a Bible study, a Bible care group, or come to church on a Sunday and sit here with all other thoughts going through our mind and we hear a bit here and a bit there and a bit there? 
how easily it is for us to be distracted. We should be quick to listen and listen carefully. How often in our personal devotional time, think about this, do we read through God's Word as fast as we can and spend no time meditating upon it and asking questions of the text so that our soul would be well watered? Be quick to listen. Second, he must be slow to speak. Some of James' readers were presuming to teach before they had paid word attention to God's word themselves. And so he, he deals with this a little bit later, and he says, do not presume to be teachers, because teachers of God's word, like me, are going to stand under judgment and experience a more stricter judgment because we have the responsibility of teaching the word of God. So be slow to speak, in other words. They were teaching whatever happened to come into their minds without first thinking about what they were teaching. It is impossible to listen to someone to teach if they are teaching stuff that they are more concerned about their own opinions than anything else. And here were these people in the context into which James is writing, presuming that they knew the Word of God when in fact they didn't know the Word of God. And so they were teaching things that were not true of the Word of God. They were just blurting out what they thought was right or wrong. And so people were being led astray. Furthermore, one should be careful not to jump to teaching God's Word too soon. It is a great responsibility. Sometimes there are people who come to faith and they, they've hardly been a Christian and they're wanting to get involved in an area of teaching God's Word when a little bit of maturity and a bit of understanding and a bit of growth in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and greater knowledge of the Word of God is necessary before they jump into the cauldron of teaching God's Word. Slow to speak. Be careful that you don't end up saying things that are not true about the Word of God. Be careful that you and I do not do our research properly enough so that when we do get to the point of teaching God's Word, we are unsure about what we are teaching. Slow to speak, quick to listen. Thirdly, they must be slow to get angry. Now, what's going on here? Slow to speak and slow to become angry, for man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Now, in the context in which he's writing, more than likely, though one can broaden this out theologically, but I don't think that's what James is intending, although one can think about this in a, in a greater theological basis. But more than likely, what's happening in that context is that arguments are ensuing. Arguments about the Word of God. Arguments about the teaching of the Word of God. And so fights are breaking out. And people are losing their temper because they disagree with whatever theology is coming out of the teaching that's occurring. And so James, when he speaks about anger here, is speaking about that unrighteous anger. Now, I'm sure you've experienced that sometimes, haven't you? Or you've observed where theological discussions start getting heated. And we disagree about certain theological truths. And the temperature rises and rises and rises until the discussion becomes angry. angry. And people start expressing their anger towards the other person because we can't persuade them round to our point of view. And we can't convince them that our understanding of the text is right. And anger results. I've seen situations like that. I've seen people get into discussions where they're talking about baptism of the Holy Spirit or talking about marriage and divorce, and expressing different views on what is and can't be done for those who are being divorced. And you watch the temperature rise until angry words get exchanged. And James says, be slow to get angry. It's not pleasing in God's sight. Now you can broaden that out. 
Not only does anger sometimes occur when we disagree with one another in terms of our theological discussions, but anger can also come where we get angry because we've been hurt in a particular way or someone has said something to us that has been unkind and we respond in anger. And James is saying, be careful that you don't operate even at that level. So let me ask you some hard questions. Have you been that person that's been engaged in a discussion about the Bible that's got out of hand? That you've been going hammer and thong, you just tooth and nail? And as you've been trying to persuade this person around, it just has turned ugly. I've been in that situation. I remember getting into a discussion when I was a much younger man while I was finishing college at a conference we had gone to, getting into a discussion about how the Old Testament points forward to Jesus and the relationship between the old to the new. And as our discussion began to develop, both of us were getting more and more and more and more tense in the, in the discussion. And then I remember to my shame and to my embarrassment, rightly so though, the other person said, I think I need to stop now because this is getting ugly. And they were right. Be slow to get angry. Don't lose your cool when you're discussing interpretive issues around Scripture where there is freedom to understand Scripture differently. On the fundamentals, we need to be agreed. But even on those fundamentals, where you're trying to help someone understand the gospel, and they just seem to be throwing curveball after curveball after curveball, don't lose your cool. Don't get angry with them. Be slow to anger. And when, at times, perhaps your understanding of Scripture is being corrected, where you've got it wrong, don't lose your cool. Secondly, God's word must be received with purity. Look what he says, verse 21a. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. Get rid of all moral filth. God's word must be received with purity. Here James makes the point that people need to get rid of all those immoral things in their life that they are fostering. In other words, here James is concerned that these people are engaged on, in certain kinds of immoral behavior, certain kinds of immoral ethical things that they are doing. And James is saying, you can't expect to receive the Word of God when you come to the Word of God with all that impurity revolving around in your life. Now, this is not James speaking about on the occasion when a person might sin and fall into immorality and then comes on bended knee before the cross and repents of that immorality. He's not talking about that. But he's talking about those who are willfully indulging consistently in immoral kind of behavior and now they think they can come to the word of God and teach it or listen to it as though that moral immorality that they are engaged in means nothing. It's like in a church once I was at way long time ago in South Africa when I was a student pastor where there was a couple in that church coming to the word, sitting under the teaching of the word who were not married but living together. And, and God is saying you can't expect to come under the teaching of the word when you are aware of some immorality in your life that you are perpetuating and that you are not dealing with. Don't expect to get anything out of the word of God. For example, if you are engaged regularly in indulging in pornography, you can't come to church on a Sunday evening or a Sunday morning when you know that in Monday through to Friday you are looking at things on the screen that you ought not to be looking on and expect to get any kind of benefit from the word of God on a Sunday morning or evening. It just doesn't work like that. You are engaged in some kind of unrighteous behavior, whether that be expressing and losing your cool and becoming angry on a regular basis. Don't expect to get anything out of God's word. 
If you are engaged and have a problem with lying and you are perpetually lying, don't expect to get anything out of God's word. If you have problems of pride in your life, and you are someone who struggles in that area of pride, and you are allowing that pride to develop and grow in your life, don't expect anything to get anything out of God's Word on a Sunday evening or a Sunday morning or Bible care group. If you are engaged and enjoy a, a juicy morsel of gossip, and you engage in gossiping about others behind their backs and saying things about them that are untrue or just gossiping about them and taking great delight in that. And then you sit here on a Sunday evening and morning thinking that somehow God's word is going to have any effect on your life. James says, get rid of that. Get rid of it. There's no place for it. If you are engaged in gluttony, and can't control your appetite. We never talk about that, do we? It's kind of one of those unspoken sins. Get rid of it. Ephesians 4 verse 22, the Apostle Paul writes to the Ephesians and he says, Get rid of all moral filth. You were taught with regard to your former way of life. Put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and, and holiness. Colossians 3.8. But you must now rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. If you have a problem with swearing, get rid of it. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Do you hear that? You can't expect God to speak to you through his word when you are harboring sin in your heart and you are feeding that sin. You are allowing that sin to fester and grow and you are not dealing with it. James says, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Jill Briscoe shares an incident like this of someone she was ministering to. She writes, Stuart Briscoe, if you don't know Stuart Briscoe, is a well-known uh, pastor, He's retired now. She says, I remember talking to a girl here in church two or three years ago. She said, Jill, I've lost my joy. I've lost my peace. I want it back. And Jill said, where did you lose it? That has nothing to do with this, she replied. Help me to get it back. But where did you lose it? I don't want to talk about that. But eventually she did talk about it. She lost it when she moved in with her boyfriend. You can't expect to have a fruitful Christian life when you're allowing those things to be harbored in your heart. No. No. James warns us here, he says, get rid of all moral filth and evil that are so prevalent. Is God speaking to you about an error in your life? That you need to surrender to God? That you need to say to the Lord, okay, Lord, I've been engaging in this kind of behavior, activity, whatever it is, you know and God knows. You can't hide it from him. You can hide it from me. And God has put a finger on it and said, I want that gone. Will you have the courage to get rid of it? And then thirdly, God's word must be received with humility. This is so fundamental, isn't it? Verse 21b And humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. When we come to the word of God, 
We don't come as those who think that we know everything there is to know about the Word of God. One of the, the things that really concerns me when I speak, speak to believers is that sometimes those who are slightly more mature in the faith kind of say, you know, I don't need to hear the gospel anymore. I've heard the gospel. I've heard it all before. I don't need to hear the gospel anymore. No, you need to preach, and we need to preach to ourselves the gospel almost every single day. There is always something new to learn about God's Word, and we should relish, and we should enjoy, and we should love hearing the gospel preached again and again and again. Tell me the old, old story. Tell it again, and again, and again. You see, the moment we think that somehow we've got it all together, and we know everything there is to know about the gospel that is so rich, and somehow we, we, we're so familiar with the Word of God that, that we've reached the point where we don't need to learn anymore. We've reached a point of pride and complacency. And there is no humility in that. No, God says when you come to the Word of God, you humble yourselves. You come with an open mouth. You come saying, Lord, there's so much yet for me to learn that I'm just scratching the surface and I want to learn more. I desire to learn more. Now, Lord, feed me. word that has been planted in us, the word that saves. It is the word of God through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ who came to die for sinners. That word saves. It delivers. It brings us into relationship with God. How much more should you and I, whenever we open up this word, do it reverently, do it humbly, and we should do it with an attitude that says, oh God, teach me today. There's stuff here I've yet to learn. You know, I can honestly say this. I've made it my practice, and I'm not saying this to try and boast. Please don't misunderstand me. Just to give you a, my way of illustration, I've made it my practice since entering into ministry to read through the Scriptures every year. And I can say after doing that for many, many years now, that there are times where I read the Bible and I say, how on earth did I not see that? And then I pause and I stop, and it happened just the other day. Reading through one of the Proverbs, I stopped and I paused and I looked at it, I read it and I reread it and I read it and I reread it, and I thought, how on earth have I read through Proverbs over 30 times and missed that? Because there is always something more to learn in the Word of God. And the moment you and I become unteachable, we are in putting ourselves in a perilous position. We humbly accept the Word. We come with open mouths and open hearts and open minds. And we say, Lord Jesus, feed me. And I don't care how many theological degrees you might have. I don't care how long you've studied the Bible. I spend hour after hour after hour every week diving into the Word of God. And the more I've come to know, the less I realize I actually know. And I realize how little I have come to grasp and how much more there is for me to learn and I'm just scratching the surface. Can I encourage you, when you approach God's Word, when you open it in your personal devotional time, when it's opened in a Bible care group, when it's opened in a church, that you come with an attitude that says, Lord, what are you going to teach me today? Now, Lord, pray and say, Lord, I'm submitting myself to your word. Speak, O Lord. Your servant is listening. In the words of Samuel, when Eli said to him, go back and say, speak, O Lord. Will we humbly bring ourselves and submit ourselves to God's word And will we accept that word when it speaks into the depths of our heart, even though it may be surfacing something that it makes us feel uncomfortable? 
It's easy to read quickly through something when we don't like what it says and think, well, we'll move on to other things. But will we stay there, ponder it, reflect on it? And when it rebukes us, and when it touches on a sore spot, and it brings that into, the, into focus, will we pause there for a moment? And will we say, okay, Lord, do your refining work? I'm not leaving here until that refining work is complete. Remember Jacob? Remember how Jacob wrestled and wrestled and wrestled with God a whole night through and said to the Lord, I will not leave until you bless me. And his hip became dislocated, so for the rest of his life, he walked with a limp. But he was blessed. Will we do that? Will we come humbly to the word of God and say, I'm not going away until you bless me, whether that be through rebuke, whether that be through encouragement, whether that be through promise, whether that be through warning. Or do we approach God's word with a sense of complacency? Oh, I know this. This is a familiar story. Oh, I've read this parable before. I know it. Or will you come and say, Lord, I've read this 20 times. Now show me what I've missed. Because there's always something new to learn. God's word must be received with humility. And now let me say one other thing before I close. It's the only way, it's the only way that people are converted. It's the only way that people come to faith. So if you are sitting here this evening and you don't know Jesus, until you come with an attitude of humility, until you come with an open mind and an open heart and say, okay, Lord, I'm willing to submit myself and listen and to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are putting yourself at arm length to salvation. But if you will come with an open heart and mind, then through the power of God's word, as the spirit takes it, he will be able to take that and burn it upon your heart and bring you to faith in Jesus Christ. But you've got to come hum humbly. You've got to come on bended knee to the foot of the cross. There's no other way. Will you do that? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way in which it does penetrate into the depths of our being. Help us to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. Help us not to get into endless debates that might become heated. And when we do come to your word, may we approach it as those who have purified ourselves by spending time before you confessing our sin. And may we approach it humbly. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Won't you stand?